office, among our friends, or with our families. And this process of individual influence is just as important as high-level, hierarchical leadership. We need buy-in from all levels to make gender equality a reality, and that's why we should all feel accountable for making it happen. I turn to our distinguished guests. First, starting here with my immediate right, I have the honor to have Her Excellency Alicia Buenrostro Masiu as Ambassador and Permanent Representative of Mexico to the International Organizations in Vienna. Ambassador Buenrostro Masiu has been a career diplomat since 1990 and was promoted to the rank of Ambassador in 2012. Before coming to Vienna, she was the Council General of Mexico in Hong Kong and Macau. And she also served as Deputy Head of Mission at the Embassies of Mexico and Madrid, Washington, D.C., and London. Also as Marketing Director at the Mexican Tourism Board in Vancouver, as well as Foreign Press Spokesperson for the President of Mexico. International Gender Champion. And then to Elisa's right, I'm happy and honored to have Dr. Yorthis, who is a full professor and chair of the Department of Organizational Behavior in the Faculty of Business and Economics at the University of Lausanne in Switzerland. <laughs> professor Dietz has been at the University of Lausanne since 2009 and recently completed a six-year term as vice dean. Previously, he was an associate professor at the Richard Ivey School of Business at the University of Western Ontario in London, Canada, and he has published and continues to publish extensively and is an expert in organizational change in culture, cross-cultural management, including workforce diversity, and linkages between employee attitudes and customer outcomes. Prior to his academic career, he worked in investment banking in Germany. <coughs> and last but certainly not least, I have the honor to introduce Gwen Perry Jones. She is the Director of Nuclear Operations at Horizon Nuclear Power in the United Kingdom and has nearly 30 years of experience within the nuclear industry. Prior to joining the Horizon Nuclear Power in April of 2018, she served as Generation Development Director and Safety and Assurance Director for EDF Energy, where she focused on creating a sustainable future for the company. Ms. Perry Jones started her nuclear career as a reactor physicist at the Wilfa Nuclear Power Station and has since served in a variety of technical and commercial roles in the UK and North America. She was the first female plant manager at the Sizewell B Nuclear Power Station. She later became station director at the Haitian One Nuclear Power Station and still holds the distinction of being the only female station director in the United Kingdom to date. Ms. Perry Jones was awarded an order of the British Empire in 2015. So with that, I'd like to go ahead and get started. As you can see, organizations, right? So, and well, oftentimes, as it turns out, they're, they're leaders more in a formal sense. They have received a rank, they have received the power, and then it's also tempting to use command and control to actually get people to do things. In some ways, that's not really leadership, even though, formally speaking, they are supposed to be the leaders. And then you have these amazing persons, let's say, the late Nelson Mandela, or Mary Robinson from, from Ireland, right? They're, they're brilliant. But if they wanted, they could just sway you with, your, with their charisma. And as an observer, you, you just admire, and at least I would be thinking, okay, I could not be that type of leader. Right? I, I could not use that type of charisma. But then if you really look around, what we find, what, what leaders do, and how we see their behaviors, and uh, their themes then, in certain ways, I think, could be part of anyone's daily activities, right? So what do leaders do? They motivate, right? So then how do you motivate? I think the first starting point usually is to indicate to people that you take note of them, that you send a signal to them that they're there. Right? So in that sense, listening is, in fact, if you reflect about it, uh, a motivational activity, and this is also what a leader would do. Leaders also enable, right? So uh, oftentimes it's a bit of an underestimated aspect, I believe, of leadership. Um, all that colleagues need is the opportunity to 
discuss a project or discuss a challenge. And I think a leader can help in these discussions to convey skills or insights that then allow people to do the job, right? What leaders do in addition is, I think they simply provide a work context that lets people get the work done, right? So I always use the example of, of salespeople in, who sell retail, who sell laptops, right? And it's extremely well known in an industry if you do not have the product on the shelf you will not sell laptops. You might be the most motivated, the most capable salesperson, you wouldn't make the sale, right? And so I think a good leader makes sure that these laptops are on the shelf and can be sold, right? So if you think about this, listening to others, discussing with others their tasks, how to best accomplish them, right? So maybe reflecting about how I can provide a piece of information. This is informal leadership, I believe, that everybody could do. And maybe one last comment. I think the difference to the big leaders is, when we do this, I just don't think we necessarily have the mindset we are leading today. I think we would be feeling we are doing our job, but this is informal leadership. <coughs> Sound very old. <laughs> 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 of course, I probably totally am. But, um, I was reflecting actually on this issue of hierarchical leadership and some of the role models that I've had. And um, I was looking up some statistics the other day, and two struck me as being quite interesting. That in the UK, in the top 100 companies, there are more CEOs called David than there are women. <laughs> and also, if you look at the top 80 UK energy companies, 86% of them do not have any female executive directors. So I think what we've got is a long way to go in terms of role modelling. And also, I think probably the industry that I work in came from, and you described command and control, it came from a, a, a place where command and control and hierarchical leadership was was really the, the mode of operation in, in terms of a safety critical environment. But I think the times have changed. And what I see is that um, what I would call servant leadership is really important in getting everybody's views on the table. And in particular for me, in terms of preserving nuclear safety, the more views we can get in, the, the better decision that we're going to make really as long as we've got a system to, to work it in. So what I see in the nuclear industry in the UK is a shift away from this traditional, hierarchical, directive leadership into a much more collaborative style. But the statistics I, I shared with you mean that we have a, a long, long way to go. Um, you mentioned in, in my bio that I have been the first and only female station director of a civil nuclear facility in the UK. That, to me, is not, um, thank you for, for putting it out there as a compliment, but actually, for me, it's a, a great worry. Where are the other women? Where have they gone? Because I know they exist within the, 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 the group of people who are running the nuclear facilities in the UK, but what's happening is somehow we're losing them. And I do wonder if it's because when we look upwards, we don't see role models, we don't see the style of leadership that perhaps we can aspire to in all of the, the facets of, you know, multi... We need, a, 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 I think, a great range of leadership to be successful. But perhaps, particularly for the women I work with, there isn't somebody up there to, to, to look at, really. That's a great point. And I think that as you should reflect also in the world that we find ourselves in diplomacy, Alicia, I think that um, reflecting on Gwen's experience. Well, thank you very much, Mary Alice, for the for the introduction. I'm very happy to be here. Yes, um, when you ask me this question, of course, you know it puts me in a position where I have to speak from my own experience. So I was the typical girl who was. I started very young in this career. I was 23. And I was very much attracted by very smart people, very well-rounded guys. So I did, it didn't matter for me whether I had to work for 24 hours as long as I was, you know, I admired them so much. And, you know, this is a hierarchical career. And then you have to move uh, in the Mexico Foreign Service. You need to move through exams all to all positions until you arrive to uh, become a minister before you can be appointed ambassador and so on. So it got to a point in which 
um, I got to Madrid and I was number two at the time at the embassy and then you realize I had a political appointee as an ambassador and then I had a team of around 80 people and then you realize that either you took charge of you know the whole group and the whole team and then you realize that nobody has taught you you know really how to manage a team you have know how to do um, <coughs> how to be the uh, spokeswoman uh, for foreign press of the president of Mexico or to do uh, the best foreign policy analysis but nobody has told you really and there was no training whatsoever uh, in terms of how to handle um, human issues, you know, uh, on a daily basis that have to do either with salaries or with somebody that was not happy at all. And then you realize, oh my God, I'm alone and nobody's telling me what to do next. <laughs> so then you realize that either really you take responsibility for that and you start understanding that in order to be a, a leader, you, it's not only about being smart in what you're doing on a daily basis on foreign policy, but it's also about being well-rounded in terms of being able to handle a whole group that it's motivated and that it's happy in what they do. For me, it's very important, for example, that my team uh, is really motivated and that they can excel as much as they can. I think that here, for example, in, uh, in Vienna, this is the first time in my life I was doing, I am doing multilateral affairs. And of course, all my team knows much more than I do. I have one of my guys, he's uh, the chair of the consultative group of the NSG. Another one has undertaken uh, the committee of the whole of this conference. I am now the chair of the CND and so on. And what I know is that as long as they are happy and they are doing, and as long as I don't lose sight of where do we want to, to go, what do we want to achieve, I think it's very important that they are really motivated and so on. But these tools, we, we never, we are not taught uh, these tools or we're not trained within this. You start only realizing that it's important because you are living on a daily basis and you know that the needs it's not only uh, about doing something uh, yourself. Now you are responsible for a whole team, something, you know, a machinery that needs to be really um, well, um, uh, well proven and on a daily basis that it really works out. So I think that this is something that you really push on yourself in order, even if you are not an expert in this, to be able to move forward and to, uh, to have this sense of direction of the objectives that you really want to uh, want to achieve, and uh, have a team that is also motivated and so on. It's not easy. Uh, you do this on a daily basis, um, and uh, but I just love it. You know, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I think that's a great point, um, and and I too have experienced that. Uh, and the command and control is something that, if you look at your role models, particularly in the nuclear industry, which were my role models. Command and control was the type of leadership I was very much aware of. And then I come to the agency and realize, that's not really the right way to do this. I realize it's the care and feeding, it's the inspiring. Which makes me then bring to my next point here. One of the questions that I asked, and as I was exploring the topic of this panel, is do men and women lead differently? And are men better leaders, or are women better leaders? So York, you're the expert. Because <laughs> I know we have, you know, we all have biases. Some of them are hidden, some yeah. of them not so much hidden. But do male and female leaders, should they behave or lead in different ways? What does the data tell us? What yeah. do you think? Like I, I know a little bit about how men lead because I am one. <laughs> I want to tell you what I don't know. Um, <laughs> no, but uh, there, there are really two stories here. The, the first story is what are the common stereotypes about women as leader and, and, and men as leaders? And, and there are essentially two themes. Uh, one theme is about the actual behaviors, and the stereotype is widely shared and widely shared at least across 50 years of, of research, right, the last 50 years, that uh, women use communal caring behaviors more. And uh, the stereotype also is that men, they would be better when it comes to commanding and when it comes to actually 
enabling action in competitive situations. Right? So uh, then when it comes to leadership, and this is something that some may not like to hear, but it was in 1990, 1977 that Virginia Shine, she's, she conducted a study on stereotypes of men, women, and leaders. And the title of the article is Think Leader, Think Male. Right? So there's a significant overlap of the stereotypes that uh, generally hold about men and those that we have of leaders. And then sadly, until today, we keep repeating this research. So in short, you know, the stereotypes are extremely alive, they're extremely well, sadly, and they are essentially that uh, the prototypical leader um, is a man. Right? So now there's the second aspect of the story. So what is it that women and, 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 and male leaders really do? Okay. And now this is actually interesting. So we have research by really an extremely well established scientist, LSD, who's done several in fact, summaries of, of, of the field, right? And in these summaries, she has more than once found that women in terms of motivating, stimulating, inspiring leadership behaviors seem to do better than men, okay? So, but, but her work is not the full story. We have also research that shows the opposite, that men are better at these types of behaviors, right? And then, it will not surprise you now, we have this research that actually ends up not finding differences in leadership <laughs> behaviors between men and women. So if you really want to get an understanding of this work, I think you have to be fair and summarize it as the data do not tell us that men and women actually lead differently or that one leads better uh, than, than the other, right? And I think this is, this is very important to keep in mind. And if you think about it, right, so, so why is it that women should lead better, or why is it that men should lead better? And you ask, independently of gender, what would possibly make for a good leader, right? So, and if you look at actually individual differences, at least on average, for example, cognitive ability does play a role, right? On average, uh, leaders t tend to be quite smart, right? So on average. If you look at personality traits, one that matters is extroversion. So, people who have an outgoing personality, they tend to be somewhat more successful as leaders, right? So, and those are fundamental, if you want to say this, predictors, individual difference predictors of what leaders do. Now you can ask the question, do men and women actually differ in terms of these types of predictors? And they don't. They do not, and from that point of view, it's only logical that ultimately, what women and men and women do as leaders should not really differ. Fantastic basic summary of, 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 of the data. And I like the results because it really does focus on a genderless set of attributes. A perfume that was being advertised, and it was called Be Good. <laughs> be good how? Be good pretty, be good well dressed, be good at my job. But what well, I don't understand, you know. So I think that the, the way in which we're conditioned as people. Um, is it starts very very early. I think um, there are lots of um, I see lots lots of changes. I think in the education system where it's trying to remove some of that sort of bias towards girls with dolls and and, and boys with tractors or whatever. Very very bluntly put. But but I think what has happened in my lifetime is that the bias um, starts to affect how you. Um, it, it almost starts to affect your authenticity because you think, well, I have to be like these people here who are, who are leaders. And I'll, I'll just tell you a couple of little stories which have helped me to sort of cement that view and try to break down those, those barriers. Um, I was running a, a rather large outage in the power station that I was station director. And I had probably about three, uh, normally we'd have five or six hundred people on site. And we had about two or three thousand people coming through to do various bits of work. So they were not known to me individually, but I was still the station director. So we'd had a year without a, an accident, a, a, like a first day of injury. And um, we decided to have a coffee and cakes morning. So I thought it'd be a great idea if I served the coffee and cakes. I was in the, the restaurant, you know, saying thank you to everybody and welcome, you know, welcoming them, welcome them in, giving them coffee and cake. So that was all about great, you know, we had a great time, lots of great conversations. 
And then the next day, I went up to the reactor pile cap where we were doing the major part of the work that, that the outage was for. And I could see a bunch of, of <laughs> men coming towards me to, to talk. And one of the guys came up to me, and his friends behind him were going, no, he said, hi, he said, hi, what are you doing up here? I said, well, I, 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 I come to have a look at the board of closure units. And, and, and he said, oh, that's great. And I think, oh, you know, I'm a really good manager, I'm visible in the field, I'm a really good leader. And he said, yeah, that's really strange, though, that you come up here. I said, well, why? Because, you know, I'm very interested in the, the way the boiler closure unit work is going. He said, yeah, but you ladies from the canteen, what have you got to do? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, then one, and then he said, what's your name, love? He said, <laughs> I said, I said, my name's, and I was, you know, I, I said, my name's my project. And the people behind him will go, ah. <laughs> and, and he suddenly got it. So the, the point I'm making is that often, as a female leader, I get um, mistaken for somebody who isn't the leader. So, so I think what happens is that you, 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 you have to compensate a little bit for that. Um, I used to, and I still find it quite funny actually, but I, I think of people who wouldn't find it funny. Um, and in fact, even very recently, I was working with some senior advisors in, in the financial industry, and I was in a, 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 a lawyer's offices and there was a, a tea and coffee place at the end, which is very similar to what's here. And I was just making some tea. And um, one of the senior advisors from another a, a law firm came to me and said, could you bring me a cup of tea? I said, yeah, of course. And then I went on to chair the meeting, which was the best time. <laughs> <laughs> so my point is, you know, you know, see it with a bit of humor, get your own back, and don't worry about it, because those, those things, uh, they occur in, for whatever reason, we all have a perception of others. And it's, you know, I, I genuinely think that probably 80% of the time people don't mean it. It's a mistake. 20%, you know who they are. And that's a different <laughs> Wow. So, sorry. <laughs> as well so when you are at the point in which uh, you need to you are alone and uh, you need to organize an evacuation for example of your community let's say somewhere in any in, in any country and uh, and then you realize that um, there is a sense of loneliness no that is something that is very much attached to you when you are facing a situation like this in which probably you are not receiving any kind of instructions whatsoever, but you know that that, that is an emergency and that you really need to move and speed up things and uh, not be worried about, you know, the, the media interview, whether you are doing or not, you are not doing or if you responded later or not. But I think that uh, these kind of situations where you have like uh, na natural phenomena having a, a negative impact on a population and then you need uh, really to, to move fast, that's the kind of thing where you really feel that you are by yourself and that uh, you really need to move um, and speed up things and so on. That's one thing. Then um, also the sense of um, mistakes, I think, that are important as well. When I used to be spokeswoman to President Vicente Fox of Mexico, I remember one day being at the OECD and it was an off-the-record meeting and for some reason we made a mistake, we brought the recorder and um, so he was on record, and for some reason we also sent that to the media. And uh, the president had said at that point that um, he really regretted having promised 7% uh, of GDP because that was not possible because all the countries in the world were facing shortages and you know deficits and, and this and that. So it went to the press and I was on the plane with the president after a very difficult press conference where the first question was, Mr. President, why did you say that you really regretted that promise and so on? And I had to come back to the plane with the president and show him, you know, in these big recorders that have, you know, like uh, kind of um, very old recorders, you know, for him to listen uh, that he has said that. And I said, yeah, but it was my mistake because we really brought the recorder inside and we were not supposed to be doing so. So these feelings of being, you know, in a way, the, the leader or the authority, but at the same time, um, 
making these kind of mistakes, which were huge at the time, and I thought, you know, like the most horrible uh, person on earth, but those are things that are come along with, with the leadership that you start exercising and so on. But one thing that I want to say as well is, and coming to what you have already said, is that something that I have learned along uh, the way is that it, when, if you are a woman, the, the leadership that you exercise should be coming from the energy of being a woman and everything that comes along the way of what a woman means. So this means, um, of course, bringing the, the sensitivity that comes along with you, and in general terms, the feminine and the female energy, which is very different from the male. I learned one of my, the main uh, lessons uh, from my time there is that if you put on a suit like a man and you compete with men as if you were a man, you will always lose. That's that is not that is not a, a fair game, and you know that's not the play of the game. I think that it's very important that if you are a woman, you exercise your leadership from uh, from the female and the women's energy that comes along with you, and that makes it precisely a very different leadership from the one of uh, of a man. You know? Well, this is an interesting point that you touch on because. We have these perceptions of what, and then all of us have these biases about what we think a leader should look like. And I know both in preparing for our panel stories today, both both Gwen and both York gave me this example of, of someone being in an accident and um, based on a study, and I, I don't tell stories well, and I'm a terrible joke tape, so talk, uh, I, can, I can't even remember the punchlines, but I won't recount the story. But the bottom line is you both had examples of biases and what leaders look like. And yet, at the same time, you're all talking about one essential element, and that's the authenticity of yourself and the ability to project that for influence. And we've talked a little bit about this word, informal influence. York, can you help us understand a little bit more what informal influence looks like in leadership? And I'll go to Gwen, because I think you have uh, an example as well. Well, first of all, let me say regarding the theme of, of, of being authentic, right? So I, I, I hear you and, and we heard from Gwen, I think, really part of the way you can also cope, cope with these leadership incidents or, you know, like, <laughs> is uh, because you, you, you sat in yourself and you get, so like, <coughs> I think probably it annoys you a bit, but you also get a good laugh out of it, right? So, and I think my point is a little bit, in some ways, I, I at least what well, I know that among men there would be a ton of variability of what it means for them to be authentic and to be authentic as a leader, right? So, so in other words, there's a wide, wide, wide range of, of different sort of patterns of leadership among men. In some ways, I assume it's the same among women, you know. And so, in that sense, I, I, I think some feed very proactively of the energy of, of being a woman, right? And others, in fact, might do as women leaders also reasonably well in, 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 in using a different style, right? So, but I think it's this, this point of, of having to identify how you define yourself in, in this role that, that, that in fact is very important and it makes it a lot easier to also deal with any incidents that, that you encounter. Now, informal leadership, <coughs> that is an interesting one I find, right? So <coughs> if you think about it, where they're leaders, they have to be followers, right? So if, if I actually came out today and I said, and now I am going to be a leader, then somehow I guess I make the assumption and somebody is gonna be the follower. Well, would you like to be my follower today? <laughs> <laughs> so my, my, my point is, in, in, in terms of using, using leadership type behaviors, right, to approach them actually with this mindset I lead today, that is not very fertile from my point of view. It's not very fertile. The issue is, I believe, I do my job, I'm mindful about what others need to do their job. And this, this could be in fact, just some encouragement, right? Motivation. This could be, in fact, 
showing them a few rules of how to, to address a task. This could be providing them the resources. And then I do it. Right? And I believe what happens if, if, if we can <coughs> approach leadership in this way, that the question is not about leading today, that the question is contributing to, to whatever the, the shared goal is. Right? And okay, others might at the end of the day say, oh wow, you really showed some leadership today, but I think it should not be my mindset that anybody says that. My mindset should be we have a job to do, here's how I can help. This is a, this is a great point. Um, Alicia both mentioned that if you have clarity of goal, it really helps both to inspire, but also to influence and push collaboratively towards the objective. Gwen, you had a point, I think, on this concept of influence and, and, and shared goals. Yeah. Um, where I was going to start from is um, this business of choosing to be an informal leader. Um, I remember when I first started work, um, my first day, my biggest problem was what should I wear? Because everybody seemed to be wearing shirts and ties and that was not what I was going to wear. And I went to meet the station director and I remember being in awe of this, this man who was running the power station. I remember thinking on that day when I was 21, I wonder if I could be a station director. And yet it took me 15 years, 10 years, to say that out loud to anybody. So my, I, I knew that I wanted to take a leadership position, but it took me a long time to express that because I, I felt that people would sort of laugh at me, I suppose. I don't know. So, so once I'd sort of chosen that path, um, I think then you, um, you reach a point in your career, and I think it's been mentioned already, about where you realise that you are the person in the room who potentially has the most experience or the most energy to solve a particular problem. And for a while I was waiting to be asked to do it. And um, uh, probably the breakthrough came for me when I moved from a job where my, I felt I was being judged on what I knew, my knowledge, to a job where really it was about what I thought, so how I processed that knowledge. And that, that transition for me was a really important one. So I was then in this position where it was very liberating actually, because no longer was I trying to deal on how much I'd read up or how much I'd studied or all the facts and figures of, of the technical piece I was dealing with. I was dealing with what did I think? And that's a great, great transition because then it becomes about what you think, what you're, and it, give, it gave me so much energy <coughs> at that point in my career. So I haven't answered your question directly, but I just wanted to make that point because I think the informal leadership is what I found when I became myself, when I was brave enough to say, well, I don't know about that, but what I think about this is, and that really, it, it's the point at which my, my career was already going on a nice, steady trajectory. But at that point where I made that choice to say I want to be a station director and to start saying what I thought rather than what I knew, it went like that. So I just wanted to make that point to the audience, really. If you're sort of sitting there thinking, you know, I'm being judged on my knowledge, then try and move yourself into the position of being judged on what you think about it, not what you know about it. Wow. And that's a great point, and, and um, but, but, but. what expertise I have in the form of management and leadership, there is that crux, that point where you have risen as a technical expert because you know the information and you're expected to produce and deliver a report on that information, yeah. so you're the expert. And then one day in your career, you're handed a management job, and suddenly you have to look at five or six, seven, ten, in my case, many eyes. And they're all looking at me. And I'm not offering technical experience. I have to tell them what I think. And once you realize that, you've moved into the leadership mindset. And at the same time, it's energizing. It's really fantastic. And then some of the gray hairs actually start to be more. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, Alicia, you probably have had a similar moment where you realized you've touched on that earlier. Sure, sure. I think that uh, being an ambassador or permanent representative in Vienna is the perfect example. I do the, jo the job of two ambassadors, but I, have, but I am paid only one salary, so, you know. I, as every woman, we love 
multitasking. Now, I can tell you, this is too much, no? And the <laughs> typical perfectionist like me that wants to cover everything and that wants to be everywhere and uh, that the sense of control is very important. Here, here, Vienna has been exactly that, uh, has represented this uh, particular challenge. Either you move to the top where you say, I am exactly not the expert, Everything is being delegated. I know exactly where do, what do we need to achieve and where are we going. And at the point you leave micromanagement, in my case, I would have to be humble enough as to say, not necessarily because I really wanted it, because it's very difficult to lose uh, this sense of control and perfectionism, but because reality also imposes and because your mind tells you Really, if you really want to move to the next dimension, you really need to leave it. So um, probably, I, I am, and I am still triggered every day by this kind of situation in which um, you leave the micromanagement to become more, to see things more from the macro level, knowing exactly uh, the direction of where you need to go. So for example, we are very much um, concerned uh, to the fact that we really want to, to make important um, or substantial progress, in, let's say, in the mandates or in, in international organizations, because uh, my country is, uh, you know, this vocation of non-proliferation and peaceful solutions and all these things. So only at the time when you realize that the only way to move forward and be, and you are really able to become a better leader is a time when, from a difficult, and personal point perspective, you release things and then you delegate, you trust, you try to motivate and you try to see things from a, a macro perspective. And then knowing, of course, that leadership is something that it's being trained as well, you know, on a daily basis because you know and you, you know that there are certain ways, behavioral patterns that you can also keep on learning in order to be able to get to the to the next dimension, that, to put it in a way. Great, great. So I hope all of you are taking note and, and learning from our own personal experience and team story. But what do you think? Can you tell us a little bit more about that and, and share from your personal experience? Yeah. Um, when I was younger, you see, this sounds like a, it's going to be a sob story already. <laughs> when I was younger, um, I, I, um, there were some practical things that sort of stopped me when I was very early. So things like there were no female changing rooms in the power station, there was no female restroom. You know, just things like that, which were just irritants, really. You know, you sort of yeah, you find a way and it's fine. And I have found through probably the beginning and the middle part of my career, I'm now going to talk about the end of my career, for goodness sake, but the beginning and middle part was, I found very easy in some ways. And, um, you know, people would talk to me about the glass ceiling and how difficult it was for women and, you know, how great it was that women were doing better. And I remember thinking, yeah, but that doesn't apply to me. You know, I'm doing fine. You know, I'm sort of stepping my way through the different challenges and it's fine. And, um, I, you know, I, I was thinking uh, that Marie Curie comment was, you know, that I wonder if it was the same for her. I wonder in, in the lab when you were doing experiments whether actually, you know, it's, it's sort of almost a gender neutral environment. But what has happened, particularly in the last few years, is that as I've become, and I, I choose my words quite carefully, a threat to some of my male colleagues, <coughs> this, this concept of the glass ceiling, I think, is, is very valid. I have a little cartoon which I cut out and I've stuck at my, on my desk, and it's a picture of a boardroom. And there's one woman and a, a number of men sitting around the table. And um, the chairman is saying, Thank you very much, Mrs. Trigg, for that comment. Now, perhaps one of the men would like to make the same assessment. And, and actually, I feel that women's voice in the boardroom, for some reason, is not being heard properly. And I don't really understand why. And I remember talking to my mum about the, this, this um, she was, she, she's now 78. And she was telling me, as she had got older, she became invisible. And I, I remember thinking, what do you mean you became invisible? 
and she's quite a, she's a smaller lady and she's she's very you know she's quite quiet unlike me of course <laughs> but um and, and now i understand because actually there's something that happens at the point at which you're perhaps seen potentially as a candidate for the top jobs where people change their opinion of you and i i can't offer any sort of insight into what to do about that because i don't know yet I'm just seeing it now. So coming back to Marie Curie, I think maybe you know her. Exp it would have been lovely to understand how she found herself in this sort of very big position. But I wonder if in the lab it was okay. But it was only when you started to sort of go outside of that and to become seen as as the leader that things start to get even more tricky. Um, the other final thing I, I, I will say, Chair, if you, if you don't mind, is that I try not to tell that story to younger women, because I see, you know, young women coming from school into university who don't have that um, world experience, which I think can can prevent you and partition you to, to be less ambitious than, than if you didn't know. So often I stop short of telling those stories to particularly to, to younger women. I don't know if that sort of answers the question, but I think for me that glass ceiling is, is real and I, I don't understand it and I don't know what to do about it. It's a fascinating point because I, I have observed that more recently myself, uh, especially in the previous role I had, and I find it this, it's interesting. It's not something senior women talk to each other about either in any context. And yet, again, you don't want to communicate to the younger generation that there's this new hurdle that you find out about. But on the other hand, um, just recognizing it, when, I think you, you had the word glass ceiling, Jack, something in your memory. Well, first of all, I mean, you started out by, by saying that f for the UK, <coughs> you observed the, the situation that there were more Davids, right, <laughs> than, than women in senior leading roles. So in other words, <clears throat> in that sense, the, the glass ceiling is, is very much a, a reality, right? So, and then you made the specification now that for you the glass ceiling became more real, in fact, as you approach really the, the very upper echelons, which I find to be a fascinating um, observation, right? So, I and I think you already provided the explanation for it in part by saying that uh, you become more of a threat, right? So, so, and 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 I, you know, in other words, at this point in time, it would not surprise me, right? It, it could happen to me quite frankly that I thought, well, there are only so many of these positions to go around. I, I really have the aspiration to find myself there as way as well. So. Not only is it positively a genderized situation, it's actually a very competitive situation and that may actually only make the glass ceiling even thicker, right? On the other hand, if you turn this now around, if I were actually sincere right, about <coughs> having, if you want to say so, the best person for this job, right? So it's like, I, I, I think, uh, you know, it's like, what would I have to do, right? Or how would I do this, right? So, and, and to me, the way I think where you can sort of like test yourself a little bit on this is to, to ask yourself, well, for example, if we have outside meetings, you know, it's like the small ones, whom do we include, right? So we, we, we let you go up to here, but this one, you, 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 you may be in or out, right? So, or it's like, uh, how do you reward if you want to say so, right? So, <laughs> um, you, you, maybe you provided a brilliant assessment when when this comment was made. You know, it's like, well, could this male colleague or make this assess or a brilliant assessment was provided, and when then a male colleague was was offered to give a new one. So, so in other words, you know, it's like, if I work with women managers and, and, and men managers, at the end of the day, do I give them the same credit for the same job done? And I think one can really test oneself on this because you do end up seeing patterns, right? And if we actually trust the data that women and women, at the end of the day, in substance, do not 
differ in terms of their leadership ability, I end up finding that consistently in my team, I only promote the men who have something to reflect about. Well, that's fascinating, uh, self-assessment. And also, again, we constantly touch on our, our biases <coughs> that are built within ourselves, the way we've been raised, the way the culture and our societies have pushed us into is this idea of actually recognizing your own power <coughs> and your own ability to, to project that power. And I'm often struck by, I have a cartoon in my office. It is two dogs sitting around the table, very reminiscent of many of our diplomatic dinners. And the dogs are talking to each other. And finally, the third dog at the end of the table, they, they, it said, they say to them, um, so here it was, blah, we know about world peace and hunger, blah, 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 blah. And then they asked me, well, what's your view? And you've already said something, but no one's heard you. And the dog, the third dog looks kind of left out. But again, I don't tell stories well, so I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me, um, unless you have anything over the last minute, I'd like to change the direction of our conversation just slightly before we open up for questions. Um, uh, at the first UN World Conference on Women, which took place in Mexico in 1975, you are now an international gender champion, Alicia, and also a co-chair of the Group of Friends of Women in Nuclear, which is a very important uh, organization. The agency is very grateful for member states uh, to having organized it, and the membership keeps growing. What does it mean to you to be a leader on gender equality? And what concrete steps do you think you want to show that you're a leader on this? And what would be the main piece of advice for anyone hoping to demonstrate leadership on gender issues? Anything uh, from your female nature. And what I mean by this is um, I really want women to know that it's very important to do what we're doing as ambassadors or um, as one is doing or in, in the nuclear sector or wherever you are working, knowing that it's very important for a woman to be able to feel successful as a woman, meaning that she has been able to develop you know, in all stages of her life if that is important for her. I remember at some point in my career, and I was first secretary at the embassy in London, talking to my mom, I spoke to her every day, and I said, well, I love my, I love my work, but I, uh, but I don't have a partner and, you know, and a boyfriend, and it's been so many years and so on. And she said, my dear, you chose a career that is incompatible with marriage. So <laughs> either you decide one thing or you decide the other. I want really women to know that they can have everything. In um, Mexico, because probably uh, we're Catholic, I don't know what is it. My mom came back and said, you know, you are always, every, you make one step further, you make progress in these, you were successful in these, and you always want something else. You are never settled down with what you have, no? I mean, keep on complaining about that, you know? In life, you cannot have everything together. Well, I want really young women to understand that this is really possible, and that it's very important, because I don't think it's worth getting to the point of becoming the gender champion and empowering and this and this, unless you feel that you have already had the chance to, to evolve and to develop in all the stages as a woman. I think that is very important. I don't want to see, like I have many friends, uh, which I feel sad in a way, um, that you get to the position um, where you're at the top, but in a way you're alone in many other ways. So, if you're okay, that's fine, but otherwise I just want young women to know. So coming back to the, um, to being the co-chair with the Australian permanent representative um, of women in nuclear, we know that we're living in a time in which it's very important also to have women on top positions because what, what they are bringing together uh, to these positions, uh, being well-rounded, prepared, and so on. If you ask me exactly um, what are you doing in uh, women in nuclear, I say, well, we're doing only baby steps and we need creativity and imagination. Um, for, it's not only, I don't think that it's only about having a statement, a statement being uh, read at the Board of Governors, but I think it's important that we can really reach out to the young girls, uh, for example, I don't know, through 
Vogue or any other media and different ways, creative ways, of what the nuclear sector will present in terms of opportunities, in terms of uh, seeing more, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, the big idea of what is the nuclear sector and why is it important, why the IEA is doing a great job in benefit uh, uh, of world peace and development and uh, medical care and many others. I think that we have not really been able to get that message across. I think it's important that we really do uh, uh, a very important work in terms of reaching out. So what we've been doing is really baby steps. We all already got around, um, I think I mentioned, 26 countries who are members and who have joined the group. I think it's important to have clear ideas. I don't want to be very ambitious because I think that things should be done properly and in the right uh, way. And I don't want to have every time that I sit and see that we have like 30 points to, to, to deal with them. I said, well, no, I think it's better to have three or four and then do this. I invite all of you um, really to become members of this. I think it's important because I believe that the female energy should be felt all around because I do believe that we have many things really to, to bring with us besides being uh, well prepared for the positions and so on. But um, being a gender champion and being a, a co-chair of women in nuclear means that we are thinking about really what would make a difference besides, uh, besides seeing more women at um, senior levels at the, uh, at the organization, at the agency. I think it's important really to reach out about what is the importance of the nuclear sector and what is the importance of, these, uh, of, of the role of the agency, which is uh, very important, probably not very well known uh, besides our small world. And um, so that's where we really need you on board in order to have very clear ideas and uh, to go, I prefer to go and do baby steps and uh, then moving and trying to do many things and in the end not accomplishing a lot of them. So uh, you are uh, most welcome, so any one of you who wants to join, um, we would love to see you there and we need of course ideas and and creative uh, energy as well, you know, to do uh, nice things uh, Thank for you. women in Nuclear. Thank, Thank you. you very much. And Gwen, one final remark. Um, what would, message would you have for young people aspiring to in your footsteps, either uh, in a technical role or from leadership abilities? What can they learn from your experience? What would be the one takeaway? That, um, for me, the key to the puzzle is authenticity. And with that, Jorg, I'd like to end with you. What do you see as the greatest opportunity for impact and on an individual level, what do you hope will be the main takeaway, the one key message from about leadership that you would like our audience to take away with them today? If I'm allowed to, I would actually like to raise two points. <laughs> One is actually a comment on, on you, Alicia. I, <coughs> I fully endorse your statement that uh, a, a woman can have a, a marriage and a leadership career, right? Because quite frankly, men apparently can. <laughs> and then you think about how is it possible, right? And, and you look at yourself and you actually find out chances are you have a great support. Right. Sheryl Sandberg uh, once said that the reason that she is having such a wonderful career in IT is, is in large part also because her husband uh, allowed supported her in having that. Right. So, uh, so, 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 so maybe to to view a, a career also, and at least for those who, who are in relationships, as as a as a tandem or a team effort, I, I think is is is, is helpful. The one thing that I would like to add is, I'm so pleased that today we have a discussion, a discussion about leadership and, and, and gender equality, and it's not just women in the room, right? Because quite frankly, because quite frankly, that I have really experienced more than once, right? So, and and what is behind that for me is 
that we need to reach this point where we can be brutally honest and open about the issues that are on the table. Right? And, and I believe this, at the end of the day, actually will go both ways. Right? So, but, but, if, but if we live in two separate worlds, one of those who champion <coughs> gender equality, and then some other world, and, and we cannot connect with these initiatives, yeah. then we, we essentially go nowhere. What we're really doing is just pitching to the choir. Right. So, so I, I, I just would yeah. so like want us to, to be frank, blunt, uh, have these conversations also maybe sometimes in a harsh way, sometimes also recognize uh, that in this case uh, the, the choice may have to, to, to go to a but I want this honesty in the conversation around it. Thank you. Now, this honesty in the conversation is an opportunity to must cope with your personal needs against the needs of the wider organization. And my advice to you, if there is anything that I can say, would be to really, really enjoy your pregnancy and your baby. And don't worry about work, it will always be here. And the organization has a responsibility to make sure that you don't fall behind in that time that you're on your maternity leave. So I would embrace that. Thank you. And so on. I think that from, from what I heard from you, you have it very clear, very clear. You already know that you're pregnant, and you already know what an inspector entails, being an inspector entails, and so on. And I am absolute, and I absolutely agree with what, what uh, has just said. The agencies, you know, and legislation, and as, and as you know, as we move towards the future. I think that women should be more supported in this regard. I think that the tools, technology, and so on, will keep women not uh, as it was before, when you had your children, and then for 10 years or whatever, you were not uh, in connection with the real world or with the world uh, of work and so on. It's not anymore the case, so I think it would be much easier. But always considering that you, that, uh, you know exactly what you want, and you know what it entails, and what and when has just said, the most important thing right now is to enjoy your future baby. So, congratulations. <laughs> yeah. Good advice. Um, I just watched the social science field, right? And, and the way that really works is like this. Guess what? You know, the faculty of psychology and sociology has an intake each year of 65% women and 35% <coughs> men. Right. And personally, I assume there's sort of like a limited pool of male and female students who will go into social sciences. Right? So it's among those. <laughs> and, 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 you know, again, I think you, it's obviously you already have to start before, but what I find even more fascinating is how my university has tried to deal with it. Right? Uh, and this is about honest conversations. So apparently, the social, the, the faculty of psychology and sociology is actually ahead on gender equality. <laughs> <laughs> and my faculty is behind. <laughs> so yeah, we need the effort at school, right? But we do not only need it for those who may specialize in, so in, in, in the way it works in Switzerland is you have a track in high school that focuses on economics, right? So, so obviously we would like to make that more attractive uh, for, for young women, right? But there's, there's also other, there's another track that favors them, these other social sciences. Of course we need to work there as well and make it more attractive maybe to men. Firstly, congratulations for what sounds like already a technical leadership job that you described at the beginning of your question. Um, for me, and this will probably um, upset some of my educational colleagues, um, I think that um, leadership for me is not an educational thing. You know, it comes from within you. And actually the techniques and tools that you can use to be a better leader and a better manager, I think there's a lot to learn. But I think that just reflecting on how you are leading in your current job, so what is it about the environment that you're in that you can practice your leadership skills in? Because there's always something, even if you don't have people working for you, there's 
all sorts of informal leadership groups that you can step into, whether it's even, you know, volunteering in the women in nuclear area, or whatever. you can find lots of areas to practice your leadership. Um, and I would just encourage you to do that, as well as the educational aspects of, of learning to be a better leader. Because for me, I have learned probably more in my day-to-day -day life Maybe it's just I haven't done enough courses yet, but you know. So, so I just urge you to have a go now and practice that leadership in real time. Great, thank you. Good answer. And so, as we wrap up, a uh, few takeaways: authenticity, practicing the leadership in your everyday life, leading from your own heart, and and taking time to be aware. With that, I want to thank our panelists very much, Gwen, York. Alicia, <laughs> the agency is, is, is I'm head of management, so I'm very acutely aware of efficiency and uh, always a gift that has a practical, efficient, multiple uses. <laughs>